Hello, uh, this is Jim Partridge. I'm a mapper and modder, and I'm just about to talk through or play through and talk through um, a map called Overrun by uh, a guy called Abraham Lee, who's uh, kind of a friend of mine, um, online anywhere and on Steam. So I hope he doesn't mind. I'm going to talk through his map and talk about the things that I think he does correctly and the reasons why I think they're correct and um, what I think it does for the gameplay and for the player. Um, so I hope whoever is watching this, if you build maps, you find this useful. Um, so here we go. Okay. Um, so we find ourselves in an empty room, nothing particularly interesting to start with. There was absolutely no reason to put this cupboard in here, we could have left this completely empty, but he didn't. So it's just a little extra something for the player to go and look in. Um, as I've mentioned in my other videos, I'm not going to go on about it, but whenever you can, always build in a tiny extra thing, just somewhere else for the player just to look in. Uh, and it really will keep them engaged the whole time, uh, works really well. Um, the other thing he's doing here is blocking a lot of the entrances and blocking the pathways, uh, as you can see here. Also, notice how there are no bad guys in this starting area. In this entire top floor, there's no head crabs, there's nothing. Um, this is great. It gives the player a chance to breathe. It's a chance to get used to where they're at, to look around, and uh, you know, before before the action starts. Uh, once again. Our way is blocked, our, we were blocked by boards there, and now we're blocked with some objects here. Uh, obviously this is a Ravenholm map, so the grav gun's really important for that kind of gameplay. Uh, Ravenholm being the first map where the grav gun was introduced. Um, and uh, yeah, so wherever you can use the, the grav gun and this kind of thing. To me, I mean, as I've said before, I think in other videos, the grav gun is, um, is key to Half-Life 2. You want to make a Half-Life 1 map, fine, go, you know, build it for Half-Life 1, it's the best place to build a Half-Life 1 map. For me, if you're going to build a Half-Life 2 map, put the gravity gun in and use it. Um, the ability to manipulate your environment to your advantage is what makes Half-Life 2 really, really special as a game, in my opinion. Um, so once again, here we are on the second floor, and still no bad guys. So we're still in a, in a safe, reasonably safe environment. Um, I had to move the cupboard to find the bathroom. There's nothing particularly interesting in here, just something to look at. Um, but you can take the toilet with you if you want to, um, which is completely unnecessary, but I like the fact he added it just because it adds a, a little more, uh, something a bit more interesting. And um, it gives you something to kill a head crab with, and whenever you can kill something with a toilet, I think um, there's a certain amount of satisfaction in that. The other thing to note here as well is that he could have quite easily boarded these windows open or made them completely empty. Um, uh, so that you could see out completely and he doesn't, he kind of puts some boards over and it just gives you a glimpse of the area outside that you're going to head into soon but not yet uh, it's quite a good way of just sort of preempting what's going to happen and giving the player a hint as to what's going on uh, Okay. so the one thing I like about this area is that he managed to make um, head crabs a bit challenging really it's, a, it's not an entirely tight space but it's enough space for them to leap to, to, to trigger the leaping action um, so which means that you're sort of constantly trying to get away from them and uh, because all the rooms are of a particular size um, it's as I said it's, I think it's quite a challenge and it's not often that head crabs are challenging so it's quite nice to see and plus we've got these kind of circular rooms, which is pretty realistic actually, I mean a lot of houses have a circular route through them. Um, which I quite like the design of it. It's a nice introduction to the uh, the poison head crab there, I quite like that. Um, uh, you know, he could have quite easily just put that on the floor, but instead he... Um, he, he put it on the table which, and facing the player as they come around the corner, so it kind of gives it quite a nice little introduction. Nothing under the stairs, which I was a bit disappointed about, but never mind, I'll leave it. So, uh, we, as I said, we've gone down, we've had little glimpses through the windows at, um, at, at the sort of the outside area, and of course you finally get the reveal here. So, you know, great job with the crows and the music, 
It really reminds us of the Raven Home feel, Raven Home vibe. Um, what's really important about this moment, though, is that what he's showing us here is the uh, the basket. Now, this basket is going to come in, is key at the end, and it's going to come and get you. So you're going to call it to your final location before it takes you out. Um, now, you don't know this yet, but you have seen it, and so. Um, Hopefully when you're in the final fight, if you look up and you see the basket coming, you realise, oh, it was that, that's what the ending, you know, that's what that was. But what he's doing is he's showing you the exits of the map at the very beginning of the map, um, which is quite a clever way to, to do things. And it's something that Valve do quite a lot as well, is you'll actually start the map quite close to the end and you'll see the, uh, the end of the map. Um, and then you work your way all the way around and end up where you, began, where you started from. Okay. So something here I wanted to show. So we've got a head crab, fair enough. But he also gives us a physics prop as well, um, which is a you know, it's like a proposal to the player, basically saying, "Oh, here's a weapon to kill it with. I could have quite easily run over here instead, and or crowbar it to death or something." Oh, I said, "I've got a crowbar." Um, point being that um, he's providing you with an option, um, a proposal, which is often a good way of doing um, doing this kind of thing instead of um, forcing the player into a particular action. Ooh, okay. So, uh, yeah, we've got a variety of options here about how we deal with this situation. Obviously, we've got the pistol we've just acquired, um, which I'm going to use, quite frankly. Um, I probably would have preferred to see a few more physics objects in this area. I mean, obviously, we've got stuff over here, but not really front and centre. I actually didn't notice there's a skeleton in that box, so that's which is quite fun. Um, anyway, but, you know, once again, we're still... He's not throwing tons of bad guys at us, we're still winding our way into this, and um, it gives us quite a nice big area. And it would have been tempting to put quite a lot of action in this area, because it's quite a large area, but, um, yeah, it doesn't. He, he, you know, keeps himself under control. I'm not going to go in there, but uh, we can break that door. It's worth going in there if you have a look. Um, okay, so here we go again. Uh, broken door. Um, and I think one thing to note about the fact that you just gave us that physics pop, and it's the same here as well, is that um, what Abraham is doing quite cleverly is he's giving us um, enough of a mixture of things for us to make our own choices about how we want to deal with the situation that we've encountered. Um, you've got all these barrels, you've got this, you've got, you know, all sorts of stuff here that we can use, and um, when we, whenever you walk into a room in Half-Life 2, you sort of are assessing your options. What's available to use? What can I use that's in the environment? Um, what can, you know, what can I do here? And you'll notice as well that, I mean, we didn't get set upon immediately. We had some time. Um, everything, you know, zombies are quite slow. We had some time to take a look around, get our bearings, see what was available, and then we, we could choose what we used to attack. And it's that kind of player choice that gives Half-Life 2 its, you know, its real core gameplay. Um, the player is continually choosing what to do and how to deal with a certain, with a situation. And I think that's what makes it really, really cool. Um, it doesn't have a huge amount of... Um, the levels are quite linear quite often. I think that's fine. That's how the gameplay was intended to be. I don't think there's anything wrong with the linear game. The um, oh, I've done that now. Um, I don't think there's anything wrong with the linear game. The choices come uh, the, the non-linearity comes in a sort of an encounter-to-encounter -encounter basis. I move into an area and I have some choices as to what I want to do. And um, a good Half-Life 2 map provides you with quite a lot of those different choices. And um, it's up to you to, to make the best of them, basically. So there you go. And I think um, one point I wanted to say was that the uh, there's a lot, quite a lot of mappers, and I did this when I first started mapping as well. I I had an idea in my head as to what the player experience would be, um, and I saw things playing out as I wanted to. Uh, as I as I saw them, uh, you know, I wanted the player to feel this and to experience this, and um, 
and that's not really the right way to go about building maps. Um, in my opinion, or from what, my experience, what I found is the best thing is to do is to present the player with a scenario and then let them deal with it however they want to, and to give them the opportunity to do whatever you, whatever they feel they want to. So, for example, here, you know, I came out, two zombies were walking away from me, they weren't paying any attention to me. We've seen this before in some other maps. Um, and I had plenty of time to once again look around, see what was going on, see what I had to play with, and then I chose what to attack with. That's uh, that quite a satisfying way to play. Come on. <laughs> Um, so, you know, that's one way of presenting bad guys, is to give us the opportunity to plan our attack and then do it. And then you get... What's nice though is he's mixing it up with other areas, so you can mix it up with areas like this, where, to be honest, things happen pretty darn quickly, and you've got to... You've got to think for yourself, you've got to think pretty quickly uh, to get out of this without getting too much damage. Yikes. Um, I didn't do very well there, but anyway, um, the yeah, I mean, it's nice to mix up these areas. So as I say, you have some sort of frantic gameplay, and then the opportunity to uh, really take your time. Um, one of the things to note there was the head crab dropped from the ceiling, so he's using the the fall from ceiling uh, option on the head crabs. Uh, it's just another way of um, introducing them to the area, which is quite interesting, rather than just uh, doing the same old, same old. I think there is a temptation to, to just put bad guys in your map. So, you know, here's a series of rooms, here's some bad guys in them. The player can then move through um, the area and, uh, you know, then play through it. Uh, unfortunately, I think, yeah, obviously that gets pretty boring pretty quickly. Um, so whatever you can do to try and introduce your bad guys in a more interesting way, then you should do that. For example, here. Like this. Um, you know, flaming head crabs are pretty creepy. Um, and obviously they're moving at you pretty quickly and we're introducing... He's introducing some bad guys that are different to what we've seen before. We haven't seen a fast head crab on fire previously. Um, and once again we will see it here when we get to this. Like that. How many ways can you introduce a zombie to the player? Well, surprisingly, Abraham finds a hell of a lot of different ways to do it um, in a fairly short space of, uh, of map. Which, you know, is, um, I think it's quite impressive. I'm not overly impressed with the fast head crabs um, attacking from behind. Um, I don't think um, a player should be attacked from behind really at all, um, unless it's sort of immediate. So, this, for example, I'm walking up these stairs and there's a zombie sitting here. Uh, the reason why there should be nothing else coming out of here, in my opinion, is because I've already been through this space um, and I've conquered it. Um, a map, in my opinion, or I've heard the theory and I very much agree with it is that map building and when a player explores a map they're basically claiming territory so as they move through an area they um, you know they they now dominate half this map I've now been through and cleared it of all bad guys therefore I own it it's, up to, it's, it's mine and um, I don't have to defend it I know obviously in some multiplayer maps and stuff we uh, we defend areas and stuff that we claim but in this case, it, as it's a fairly linear gameplay, I've won this. This is mine, and it should be under my control, and nothing bad should be coming out of there now, because I've killed everything in there. Um, and I think that's quite important. I think if you start... I think this is the problem with spawning things behind the player, is, is that, it, you know, that's their space, and you're, you're basically cheating, once again. Um, um, I think your player feels a little bit cheated, if, that's, if that happens. Um, you notice there, you know, just a, a room that obviously that may have one been just been one solid brush with some windows down the side. Uh, he decided to hollow it out 
and just simply make one of the windows empty, have the zombie fly out through it, and if you go in, you find some goodies. Um, it's a little bit of extra gameplay, added an extra 20 seconds to my game experience, but it certainly, you know, it all adds up. Um, one nice thing in this area, which I have discovered, having played it a few times and being told as well, is that the um, this puzzle for the crank is um, is actually a randomised. Um, the crank will appear in different areas depending on um, on each time. It's a that is using a case logic uh, entity to uh, randomise the location of the um, of the crank, which is cool because it gives a little bit of replay, um, a little bit of replay value. And um, it certainly keeps me on my toes. This is the third or fourth time I've played through it, and it's absolutely right that the crank is appearing in different places. That is what I see. Uh, it's there. Previously, I found it in the back of the truck and in a few different places. Um, oh, quick thing back here. Loops. Here he is. We can get in this door already, wrong because there was a, a chair up against it. Um, you created a player loop we've just come back out and um, once again this is about claiming territory in my opinion we've now unlocked this kind of loop here of this map and um, we now claim all of this area well, I'm now claiming it all and I dropped my crank there it is okay. <laughs> um, there we go <laughs> do it from a distance um, Okay, so the crank handle puzzle, obviously we've seen it a lot, but adding a little bit of randomness to it isn't too bad. Um, personally, I prefer players who make an effort to try and make a custom puzzle, um, but bearing in mind we had two weeks to put this together for God's sake, so I'm not gonna, certainly not going to pick holes in that. One thing I like about this area that's quite clever is... Um, it's proving a point is that you don't have to gate the player in in order for them to stay where they are. So, you know, here we've got a bit of an arena, you know, with lots of zombies coming out. So we've got a poison zombie and a bunch of other stuff. So I'm running around, I'm killing them and stuff like that. I don't really, as you know, as a player, I don't really have time or the inclination to explore and to look for a way out properly. I'm just busy trying to deal with these guys and um, you know, making sure I don't get damaged. Um, but actually what's clever is, is that he hasn't gated us in. He's not forcing us to stay in this area at all actually. Um, the way out is still perfectly accessible, I'll show you in a second. Um, there is no gate, there's nothing forcing us to stay here. Um, the exit is just over here, it's got some boxes in front of it. and the pallet but it was here the whole time and I could have I could have just moved through this and carried straight on with the map but because I was busy having a bit of action running around trying to save my own ass I wasn't in an exploring mode so I didn't look for it uh, and as I say quite often map makers I think um, worry about the player being able to leave an area or whatever um, and I don't think it's necessarily always the case I think that um, you know you don't necessarily have to have to do that. Um, there's a whole there's a magnum up there. If you want to go and get it, um, I like this just because it's once again an extra bit of gameplay. If you go up there, you can come back down. Um, he spawns a whole bunch of extra head crabs, so there's kind of an extra bit of challenge for you. Uh, you've had a reward for your exploration, now earn it. Um, so I'm going to throw some head crabs at you and make your life more difficult. Once again, looping brought us back out into a familiar place. Uh, we now own this building. In our minds, in our psychology, we own this building. We own this territory. Cupboard for no reason whatsoever. Just something to m make the room look a bit more interesting and um, there's a whole there's a couple of videos online about positive and negative space as well, and that's quite good. And the fact that you know, what's negative, re 
recess here just adds a bit more of an interesting shape to the room. It would otherwise just be a box. Um, good point here as well is to look at is his actual mapping style. It's very basic. I mean, that is literally just, you know, a triangle with some uh, with, with with some textures on it, um, but some obviously some triangular rooftops. But look at this; it's just square blocks, one to eight by one to eight. Very very basic, but the gameplay is great and the lighting is good, and I'm just completely, you know, I'm happily in Ravenholm doing my thing, even though there's really not much going on graphics-wise. It's all very blocky, very square, but it works. It just shows you you don't need to go crazy with the detailing and spend years, you know, detailing every single area to make it as realistic as possible or whatever. You just don't need it. Very straightforward. I think fast zombies should be um, used a bit more, you know, in a sort of a, an area that encourages a lot of movement. Here, you know, we're a bit sh a bit hemmed in as we were in the loft there. Also, I think they're much better used jumping around rooftops and stuff, so you actually have the opportunity to shoot them as they're moving around. Uh, for anyone who wants to use them, I think that's the best way to use them. Um, One other thing I found with this is um, I'll in a second, an observation I had. Um, this is brilliant. I love it. It's great, right? But to me, that should have been the way that the fast zombies were introduced to the player in the first place. So the first time the player encountered a fast zombie, it should have been like that, in my opinion, uh, just to introduce the bad guy in an interesting way, a, n a new enemy that we haven't seen before at that point. And here we go, we drop down into our final arena. Um, the layout of this arena is quite cool in the fact that we've got this main kind of thoroughfare with some obstacles in the middle, so we've kind of got a figure of eight thing going on around the um, around here and here. And then we've also got this whole loop here. And that gives us quite a lot of, uh, of things to play with. No. Ah. Uh, yeah, it gives us quite a lot of uh, interesting movement, um, and that's really all you need is just a few obstacles and a few things to that you can put between yourself and the bad guys um, before your uh, yeah uh, to allow the player enough room to, uh, to do so, to use their skills that they've got. Basically, the whole thing we should be doing here is is creating scenarios where the player can utilise their skills um, and basically feel clever. Um, I don't think a map is necessarily has to be difficult. Um, I don't think you know we have to make it as challenging as possible or throw 500 you know zombies at the, at the player. Um, I don't think it's necessary. I think that the player is um, you know challenge is good but fun is more important than challenge in my opinion and a map I don't think my maps are particularly difficult um, to play or to win at, but they're certainly I try and make them as fun as possible. Um, and yes, we've all played the games a lot. Yes, we've all got a lot to, uh, you know, we all know how to how to manoeuvre around and uh, to pretty much run rings around the bad guys, really. But that doesn't change the fact that it doesn't have to be, you know, cranked up to ridiculous amounts of difficulty. Um, I actually don't find that kind of gaming very fun. Um, and I think something can be challenging. Oh, well, put it this way: I think I think a goal of any mapper should be to um, to get as much challenge out of as few bad guys as possible. I think that's really important, um, and you can do that, you know, with. Um, I think you can do that by. Uh, by really just playing with, with the layout of maps and playing with the layouts and the scenarios you, you built uh, to try and get the most out of the bad guys that you've, you've got in the maps. 
um, before you add more bad guys to make it difficult to see what you can do. I mean, these fast headcrabs are crucifying me. They are real, real bitches. I hate them. Um, and I honestly think that fast headcrabs are probably the most dangerous thing in the zombie arsenal because they're such a pain in the ass to try and get hold of. Ah, now I'm in trouble. Yeah, there you go. That's what I get. Let's try that again, shall we? Um, now, I mean, you know, we're not. There were plenty of zombies there. I got caught in a corner, fair enough, and that's my own fault. Um, but, uh, you know, I don't think that was particularly too many zombies. I think we did quite well with. I think he's doing quite well with the amount of zombies he's introduced to this area. Sure, it's busy, and you really do have to be aware of what you're doing, but. Um, I instantly want to get up and try again, and that's the most important thing. Um, if you can make a scenario where the player is quite happy to face your challenge again, then you've won. Then, then as a mapper, you're doing the, you're doing great work. Um, because, quite frankly, I, I'm quite happy to you know to take this on again because um, it's quite fun. Because the area is quite dynamic and there's quite a lot. I've got a lot of options as a player. Um. Oh, these fast head crabs are killing me, I swear to God. Well, literally. Right. I am not the best half life kick player in the world, even though I like building maps for it. I really. Um. Oh, the island. Yeah, here we go again. I'm getting caught in a corner. Um, and I guess this kind of uh, gaming is all about. Ah, good lord. <laughs> Alright, maybe there are too many zombies in this area. Um, one more go. But see what I mean? I'm quite happy literally to do it again. Bring it on. Uh, I think I should probably spend more time actually trying to kill the zombies instead of getting away from them. Uh, instead of trying to get away from them. No batteries around here. Okay. Um, so I'm not sure quite how he's triggering these either, whether it's all timed or whether um, the death of one zombie uh, triggers more. But um, it's reasonably well paced, I think. Um... Just go a bit crazy at one point. Damn these ball. Fast head cramps. Piss me off. Hmm. Okay. Um and I think that's what's quite good about this area as well, is that you spend most of your time sort of trying to create pathways for yourself and create exits. But that's the problem with fast head crabs is that you really do, you, you need to see them coming. You need plenty of room for the player to be able to get away from them. Um, because, you know, they can be quite brutal. Check anything I can at these bastards now. I guess overrun is a pretty, uh, pretty accurate, accurate description. Um, yay, it's here. I made it, finally. Thank God for that. Right. Um, so, now we're actually finally out of the map, thank God. Um, I think it's also... This section, this idea, obviously, it's a bit of a take from... Um, from Half-Life 2, from Ravenholm, when you get into the... Uh, when you get into the... into the basket uh, that Grigori sends down for you. Um, 
and it, it really captures that same vibe again I think that's what I liked about it was that it's so spot on for, for that feel that you had when you were in Ravenholm um, and when you were in the basket of the, oh my god I've just survived this and look at look down there look at all the craziness that's going on that I've just managed to get myself out of and the whole place is going crazy um, and it's a really great feeling as a player you feel you know like whoa just about made it you know and uh, to a certain extent you can you can uh, shoot and get your own back a little bit at this point from a place of safety So there we go. Um, those are the reasons why I think this map, for me, would have been my winner. Um, and, uh, yeah. I hope you enjoyed listening to this and hope it was useful. And uh, if you haven't played this yet, oh my god, go and play it. It's great. I love it. See ya.